September 1945, after a 30-kilometre march from the Peak Bog Camp No. 117 4, the new camp environment seemed like a luxury. The former warehouse building of a large chemical plant was equipped as a dormitory for about 500 people. Under one roof there were a sleeping hall, a kitchen, a dining room, a bathroom with showers and baths, a disinfection room and a medical station. Heating is centralised. There are separate premises for service rooms and separate housing. The camp area is separated from the territory of the chemical plant by a high fence. Everything is surprisingly well prepared for the reception of German prisoners of war. The scale of amenities is brand new. The only scourge is rats and bedbugs which we fought with in the previous camp. The rats were dealt with rather quickly, while the bedbugs have so far repelled any human attacks. The more you squeeze them, the more of them are born. I suffered more from them than from hunger during my captivity. The life of new arrivals necessarily begins with quarantine and disinfection. Lice among us is negligible, and in this camp it will gradually decrease to zero. Sanitary provision is exemplary, go under the shower when you want. Shmi hot water is available at any time. The food is decent. It could be better if the prescribed norm of products is fully brought to the consumer. Unfortunately, certain circles, both of Soviet and German origin, consume in excess of the norm at the expense of the rank and file. Even during the quarantine period, the political officer, Lieutenant Vedenikov, appears. He's looking for certain persons, including me. Are you a cadet of the anti-fascist school? Yes, I am. Do you speak Russian and write correctly? Yes. You'll be a senior anti-fascist activist. There will be three more besides you. It's time to be surprised. For a whole year after graduation, no one mentioned that I was a cadet. The logical conclusion is that I'm not worthy to participate in political work. My name was removed from the lists. I'm written, but suddenly such an honor. Senior asset? This is a full-time position, i.e. again I was released from hard physical labor, and I applied all my mental and physical strength to worthily justify the trust. Discussions with comrades, reading newspapers, classes on the Soviet system, organizing meetings at which Soviet political workers would speak, studying a short course in the history of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, to interpreting duties when the political department staff needed to talk to individual prisoners of war, etc. There could be no boredom. One of the tasks of the anti-fascist activist was to organize a socialist competition of production brigades. We were required to convince our comrades of the need to make socialist commitments to convince them that they were atoning for their guilt before the Soviet people by making great efforts to restore the socialist economy. In general, the anti-fascist activist is called upon to act as a chaser in production. It has become shameful, shamed because the majority of workplaces are characterized by extreme primitiveness, and that in such an environment, exhausting oneself, it is objectively impossible to fulfill the norms. Non-fulfillment of these norms entails a reduction in the nutritional norms. It should be mentioned here that prisoners of war, as a labor force, were provided to economic organizations on the basis of contracts, concluded with a certain department of the Ministry of Internal Affairs or the Gulag. According to these contracts, the legal position of prisoners of war and civilian brigades did not differ from each other. The economic organization had to pay the Ministry of Internal Affairs according to the all-union labor standards. No one informed us about this but in time it became possible to compile a complete picture from individual scraps of information. The prisoners often worked in the neighborhood with civilian brigades, and four men and four women attributed to them a part of the result of the prisoners' work. We see that our people in some places work more than civilian brigades, and in the daily overhead the difference in the fulfillment of norms in the amount of 50 and more percent at the loss of our people. In such conditions, how can we stimulate our comrades to new and new labor obligations? Obviously, the bosses at the workplace have a different understanding of labor standards, which are fixed in some unfamiliar hand. Being in camp detention, it is impossible for us, activists, to raise the spirit of our comrades without determining the objective reasons for not fulfilling the norms. We began to argue with the chief of the political department. Give us the opportunity to regularly visit the workplaces of our brigades together with you, or let us go there without an escort. Lieutenant Vedernikov exploded with a scolding when he first became acquainted with such ideas. He suspected a riot. 
We appealed to camp commander and presented some scanty evidence of unequal attitude of foreman to the results of work of Soviet and German brigades. Captain Glasnov took a more pragmatic attitude to our complaints and agreed to attach individual activists to certain workplaces where they were allowed to walk freely from one brigade to another. The success of our visits to the factory, construction sites, etc., was very modest. Attempts to familiarize ourselves with the state norms failed completely. They were concealed from us and this gave Russian masters the opportunity to make additions to their brigades at the expense of prisoners of war. The position of Soviet masters and foremen is quite understandable. If the earnings of both my own workers and German prisoners of war depend on me, is it a sin to credit my own at the expense of the fascists? From the point of view of the victor, such reasoning may be correct. But here is our reaction to such a violation of human rights. We will not let them steal our rations so easily. A secret struggle ensued. We secretly went to the foremen's booths, looked for a handbook of state norms and rewrote the norms that concerned us. I personally managed to make more or less friendly relations with the leading persons, on whose sites the prisoner of war brigades had never... They did not pay attention to the competition of their neighbours and did not suspect any harm to their colleagues in providing me with the necessary handbook, step by step. We thus achieved a noticeable increase in labour indicators without increasing the intensity of the physical work of our comrades. Sometimes we even managed to achieve the application of more favourable norms where in fact it could not be allowed. The process was slow. The labour of the activists was painstaking. But as a result, all parties involved were satisfied. Brigades began to be given full rations. Some were given cash. The camp administration was commended for the growth of labour indicators. The political department was commended for the successful conduct of socialist competition, and members of the anti-fascist activists were given the honour of advanced workers and a pass to the disconvoyed, a pass with a triangular stamp of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. In format, colour and internal design, this pass did not differ from the document of the Ministry of Internal Affairs officers. On the last page it was only written, he has the right to move from the camp to his workplace and back without an escort and who dared, after the identification of the Ministry of Internal Affairs stamp, to demand that the pass be handed over for a thorough check of all its pages? Nobody. They learned to show the pass in a flash with an elegant movement of the hand, following the example of the real employees of this ministry, the secret of obedience to which was most often under an eye-catching luxurious leather coat. In addition to the professional display of the pass, mastered the walk and manner of these people to hold themselves. Such tricks backed up success not only in the workplace. In general, the situation on the labour front of the prisoner of war brigades improved from month to month. Let the reader not think that this process went on smoothly, without failures. No. The resistance of foremen and forewomen was organised in some places. At certain sites we were threatened with sticks and stones were thrown at us. I personally received a kick in the ass more than once. Finally, the camp authorities were the winners in this struggle and the growing support of the administration contributed to the success of our endeavours. It should be mentioned, however, that this conflict did not break out at all labour sites. There were some sites where the selection of the proper labour standard was carried out without any deviation. There were also sites where only prisoners of war were. Fulfilment of norms by 150-200% was not uncommon. And at such sites, so the Russians told us, labour conflicts began after the Germans left convinced of the defensive power of our passes, we reached the point of willful abuse. The city of Gorky from the station Igumnovo is at a distance of 30 kilometers. It takes 40 minutes to get there by train, and in Gorky there is a fair. May you go to the fair with me? Impossible, I think. Why violate the rules and perhaps for such a crime to pay for the removal from office? No, I think, and my comrade convinces me of the boundless innocence of such an act. I agreed. We went to the station, took a seat on the foot of the car, and drove off. We reached Gorky safely, found the fair not far from the station, admired the colourful picture of booths and benches, drank 100 grams of alcohol and returned to the station in time. So the electric train is approaching. The carriages are not crowded. There is no reason to ride on the step. We got into the carriage, sit on the bench, without tickets, of course. There is a German proverb. When a donkey feels too good, he goes to the ice to dance. It turned out that we were already sitting on the ice. Five minutes before Igumnovo station, the car door opens. A police officer comes in, followed by two policemen with bayoneted rifles. 
Come on, comrades, show us your tickets, please. Secretly, we get up from the bench and head to the opposite side of the carriage. But alas, a third policeman has already taken up a position there. So we're lost? Why did I do such a stupid thing? I look at my insolent comrade. He faces the approaching officer, raises his head and stands in the manner of those who wear leather coats. At precisely the right moment he pulls out his pass, opens it skillfully and raises it under the officer's eyes. I'm stunned, but it comes to my consciousness quickly enough that Souse is my only chance. I take out the pass, trying to assume the same pose the comrade shows me. At that moment the train stops at Igumnovo station. The comrade mumbles, I have to get off. With a fleeting glance, the officer notices the mere stamp and tells the guards, let them through. It was difficult to get off the wagon in the manner of those who wear leather coats. The comrade very discreetly explains to me that employees of the Ministry of Internal Affairs do not need a ticket on means of public transportation. So how he knew? I don't know. It should be added that our appearance had nothing in common with the German military uniform. We were dressed in the uniform of demobilized men, a gymnospira, trousers, Kiersovi boots, a red army cap without a star, where we got such a masquerade from. I meals in this camp deserved only a lower than average rating. In the morning, a daily portion of bread and porridge, at lunch, soup and porridge, and at dinner, soup, and the camp is supplied with products on a monthly basis. It means one month, a porridge and soup, another month, oatmeal, then buckwheat, and so on. The supply of peas and lentils was feared because 120 grams of these products per day give only modest portions of liquid porridge, and in soup the nutritious product is deposited at the bottom of the cauldron and distributed in more or less rich quantities at the will of the cook. Complaints of unfair distribution of soup are received in the active. It is difficult for us to bring on the prisoner of war. Self-government is now dominated by Germans. The administrative part is in charge of everything except political activities. The kitchen staff is subordinate to the administration, i.e., we, the members of the political collective, can influence the cook only through the camp chief. It is not easy to discuss the problem of soup distribution with him. Why? Yes, any leader needs supportive persons who are taken on duty by agreements. If you give me unconditional support, you will get some privileges. One of the most important privileges is a special position to watch over the cook who distributes soup and porridge. So, a good cook in the eyes of the senior camp is a cook who is ready and able to remember to whom more, to whom less. The appointment of persons to the position of cook is the business of the Soviet kitchen chief, but recommendation proposals are submitted by the senior camps. The cook tries his best to stay in the kitchen forever and therefore unconditionally follows the instructions of the administrant. More for one, less for another. And the art of the cook is to hide the uneven distribution of nutrients in front of the mass of ordinary, unprivileged prisoners. Sash was Finns. The workers of the brigade take turns assigning a supervisor, who takes his place next to the cook and controls the trajectory of the ladley's movement through the soup. Democracy won, and the demands on the chef's skill increased. The agreement was reached after grueling negotiations with the German camp superintendent. Peter, a man ten years older than me who was captured at the surrender of the Sixth Army in Stalingrad, he speaks and reads Russian well, but he can't write, and I help him in this area. He treats me like a patron of the arts to a young pupil, and the cooperation between the senior administration and the senior political staff is on the basis of mutual benefit. He did not conceal before me that he was a pimp by profession and as such he possessed all the tricks and intrigues necessary to gain the upper hand in the struggle for power. I listened with interest to his stories of the struggle for territory in the Berlin Red Light Milieu, but this study had no influence on my principles of life. I have remained naive in this respect to this day, and I am living proof that it is possible to achieve personal success without a thirst for power. I did not climb very high, and therefore the regular falls downward were without serious injury. Let us return to the problem of nutrition. In summer, there is a natural supplement, nettles. The recreational team groups and at times even dystrophics go out into nature and collect these plants. The lazy cook throws the crop into the pot, and when the soup is served, the stems stick out of the pot. The diligent cook crushes the plants and makes a soup with quite a nice flavor. It is only a pity that around Zvodstroy the vegetation is almost completely destroyed by the abundant release of chlorine gas. During the war, the plant produced chemical warfare agents. Foskine, Lust, and Lewisite. 
Emissions of these substances finished the destruction of vegetation in the area with a radius of about 2-3 kilometers around the plant. Nettles belong to a group of plants that absorb significant amounts of poisonous substances and accumulate them in their leaf tissue. No one thought about this, and the result of the additional feeding of people was not subjected to any research. At the end of September, shortly after our arrival in this camp, potatoes were brought to the zone by cars, a stock for the whole winter. We built tents over the bunches in the yard and waited for frost, so the frost came. Frozen potatoes from the tent directly into the boiler, a well-known technique, and the taste of potatoes and nutrition do not suffer. The main thing is to keep the frost. At the end of December there was a thaw, then frost again, and after the new year there was a new thaw. The only thing left of the potatoes is rot. Some inventor or professional specialist in fermentation technology determined that the starch rot was enough to produce alcohol. A small amount of bread served to initiate fermentation, and elements of a distillation apparatus of very simple construction and active carbon for filtration of the final product were dragged from the factory. Samagon was unimportant in taste, but its effect on the organism was highly appreciated. It should be noted that the distiller worked in the kitchen in the presence of the Russian chief, who did not suspect what was actually boiling there. Samagon is one side of the coin. The loss of the main foodstuff for the whole winter is another. The only product is bread. On our own bodies we have experience in this direction that a man can perish from the abundance of bread. In this hungry winter, other indispensable foodstuffs were lacking. The ration plan looked like the supplied, given in return, 50 g, meat, 150 g, 20 g, fat, 80 g, bread, 120 g, cereal, 200 g, bread, 100 g, vegetables, 100 g, bread. I do not vouch for the correctness of the figures, but I remember that the daily ration of bread was up to 2 kg. In the morning, bread porridge. At lunch, soup and bread porridge. At dinner, bread soup. The porridge is thick. The soup is thick. In addition, a kilogram of bread per person. In the beginning it was fun. We ate to our heart's content from day to day. But over time the appetite waned. At the work sites began a dashing trade using bread as currency. The main demand was for onions, cabbage, and fish. The civilian population's stock of such products was modest and prices were correspondingly high. Most of those who were taken out of the camp to work endured the period of one-sided diet in different ways, some without any consequences, others with the loss of working capacity. First began to suffer from scurvy OC and dystrophic, first inflammation of the gums, then the symptoms were extraordinary. Scurvy, according to the medical textbook, begins with inflammation of the gums and loss of teeth, and then there's unbearable joint pain and eventually progressive paralysis of the arms and legs. I try to imagine what was going on in the brains of those who were responsible for the lives of about 500 prisoners of war. The population is starving all around. The ration of bread for citizens engaged in physically unheavy work is 200-300 grams per day. Prisoners of war are given 2 kilograms, and the result is a growing incidence of disease. The number of the authorized personnel to be taken out for production work is decreasing day by day. One should not even think about fruits or vegetables with high vitamin content, where to get the necessary vitamins. It is a real disaster, and there is no way out. The mood of the prisoners of war fell into a black hole. No one tried to explain to themselves the predicament of the camp commanders. Those who suffered blamed it on the Russians. They, they said, were killing us quietly, but the commanders were at an impasse, even to us, activists. None of the political workers could explain what the matter was and what should be done to save our comrades. We were also stuck in a dead end. What kind of political propaganda for socialism could be conducted when a whole group of people felt condemned to a slow death? Among the prisoners began to talk about the fact that the insidious Russians want to quietly kill us with such nutrition. It was possible to slow down the course of the disaster by giving out a decoction of spruce needles as a drink. Then some medicinal yeast appeared. Then, with the onset of spring, it was possible to start harvesting nettles. The monotony of eating bread alone was gradually changing. Cereals arrived, unfrozen potatoes and sprat in huge barrels were brought. The situation stabilized, some people recovered, the number of workers began to grow, but the distrust of those suffering from scurvy reigned for a long time. One of our brigades worked in the harmful workshop. No, 
11, which produced raw materials for tetraethyl lead, a substance for refining gasoline. People there worked constantly with gas masks, in an atmosphere saturated with chlorine, and they were given extra rations, milk, and a privilege unavailable to other prisoners of war. They were allowed to use the services of the factory clinic. One day, one of the members of this brigade came to me. He was suffering badly from a toothache and asked me, who already spoke Russian, to accompany him to the clinic as an interpreter. We set off, went to the registrar's office. I explained to the nurse working there that he was a member of a harmful workshop brigade and his tooth hurt intolerably, and we asked to be admitted to the doctor. The nurse listened attentively to me, looking sympathetically at the swollen cheek of my comrade and I, while stating our request, involuntarily reflected on what this Russian woman must be thinking and feeling now, seeing before her two Germans, prisoners of war, but recent opponents in a cruel war. What would have happened in a similar situation with Russian prisoners of war in Germany? I asked myself, most likely, they would simply have been kicked out of the polyclinic immediately. Perhaps it was also because of such thoughts of mine that the nurse's reaction to our request seemed like a miracle. Without further ado, the woman wrote out a medical card for my companion, politely and friendly escorted us to the dentist's office. Having kindly pointed out the place where we should wait for our turn to see the doctor, she took the card into the office and returned to the reception desk. The line was large. A few benches along the walls in the corridor were not enough for half of the patients who wanted to get to the appointment. But suddenly, the second miracle, a doctor looked out of the office and invited us to come to her without waiting in line. In the office, while the doctor was treating my friend, I was sitting next to her, and she was having a relaxed conversation with me, asking about my fate with genuine interest. She was a young and very pretty woman, and it was pleasant to talk to her on any subject, even on such a subject as the unpleasant fate of a prisoner of war. Having finished treating the comrade, the doctor said, Now you sit down. Let's see what teeth. I was taken aback. Embarrassed, I replied that I had no complaints and besides I was not a member of the brigade of a harmful workshop. Sit down, she repeated even more insistently, almost like an order. Scurvy, summarized the doctor, looking at my mouth. It must be treated, otherwise you'll soon have no teeth. She carefully treated my gums with some liquid, treated me and my comrade with ascorbic acid, and, saying goodbye, told us to come to see her in a day. Leaving the doctor's office, I was afraid of the murmurings of those patients who had to make sure that the damned Krauts were accepted for treatment without a waiting list. But to e the third miracle in the course of these events, no one swore at us aloud. On the contrary, the expression on the faces of the waiting patients seemed rather friendly. She saved my teeth not only for me, at her insistence. I subsequently took many of my friends to her and no one in the clinic never once asked whether the patients were members of the harmful workshop brigade. Shatu Suplamis Saviour, what motivates you to help us? And so unselfishly and to such an extent, her answer shook me deeply. My brother, she said, was taken prisoner by the Germans. He escaped, was caught and imprisoned in Dachau concentration camp, which meant imminent death. But he miraculously escaped from that death camp as well. Still, as you can imagine, it was easier to escape than to evade pursuit, much less to hide somewhere safe. However, he was lucky. Schauf dead from hunger and fatigue. He was found in the mountains in southern Germany by a German peasant family. These kind and brave people not only did not hand him over to the Nazis, but fed and hid him until the American troops arrived. My brother came home alive and well. I consider it my duty to repay the Germans with kindness for the good they did for my brother. More than half a century has passed since then. Time has erased many events and impressions from memory. Many names have been forgotten, but not the name of this amazing Russian woman. I'm sure that the grateful memory of many of my comrades in captivity keeps this name as firmly. Heartfelt thanks to you, Anastasia Fyodorovna. By the end of June, we could talk about the normalization of the physical condition of most of the people in the camp but a dozen, three or four of the dystrophics had not recovered. Some of them were sent to the central hospital, but 15 people with symptoms of paralysis of limbs remained in the camp. The head of the political department turns to me with an order to prepare to leave on a business trip. As usual, no explanation as to why and where to go. I put my bag on my shoulder and went to E.E. the escort and me. We took a train to Gorky, changed trains and headed north. Disembarkation in Balakna, walking through the town, landing on the peat track, 
a narrow-gauge railway that carries peat from the neighbouring bogs to the Balakna thermal power plant, sitting on the brake platform of an empty car. We admire the nature and feel as if we were on vacation. Quite unexpectedly, the escort decided to get off the car at full speed of the train, i.e. at a speed of at least 15 km per hour. Further on, we move on foot through the forest. In the clearing is a village, the per On the way, the escort reveals a secret. There is an order to prepare a place of cantonment for a team of prisoners of war. He doesn't know what I have to do with it. And a trusted person in the village, Telegin Nikolai Pavlovich, meets us friendly. Exactly us. Negotiations are conducted by the escort. We sit in the front of a graceful hut, surrounded by the Telegin family talking. We came from a distant city, and we need to know what's new there. I am treated on an equal footing with the convoyer, and they do not determine my nationality either by my conversation or by... One doesn't speak pure Russian. Well, what's so special about that? There are Tatars, Chuvash, people from the Baltics, from the Caucasus, who have different accents. That's what these villagers must have thought. The convoyer supports this production by not giving me away as a German with a word. In the end, we told the truth and nothing in the treatment of me changed. I considered it a great honor when, a few months later, Nikolai Pavlovich said to me, You are up, but chronologically, it is still a long way off. For the night, my escort and I were given a matrimonial bed in the back room of the hut, while the whole family, father, mother, three children, grandfather and grandmother, spread out on the floor, benches, stove and shelves in the front. We must recognize an act of extreme hospitality. Like polite guests, we endured the greed of hungry bedbugs. It was felt, and later confirmed, that the whole family slept in the front, even when there were no guests. So the next day we returned to camp by the same transportation. I was a little surprised that it was me who had been sent on such a business trip. I should think that I was rewarded for some successes, but I could not figure out what kind of successes. The mystery was soon revealed. Meanwhile, a new cadet arrived at the camp, Alexander Sasha. His arrival pleased me as I became friends with him at first sight. A man of high intelligence, a connoisseur of all the basics of Marxism-Leninism, able to appeal to comrades, sympathetic in any respect. Looking at this event from the point of view of an old man with the experience of three quarters of a century, I am surprised at my night. I was a senior asset, and the proximity of such an expert should have warned me. A rival had appeared. But no, he helps in political work. You can talk to him on any topic. He has a lot of practical experience because he has been in captivity for two years more than me. I did not have to think about rivals. So far, I have never risen to a higher level of activity and I have never made any effort. It just fell to me. Quite unexpectedly, there was a call to stand for some position. I feel seen as follows. If I am called, there is no need to be afraid of rivals. So it was done with me up to the last day of captivity, and my free labor life passed under the same motto. More than once I was brought down and more than once I wondered, why? More than once I have been elevated and posed the same question. That's why I was not excited by the news that I was appointed as the senior of the team, which is made up to collect berries and mushrooms in the forest around the village of Perikfotkino. It is strange that a senior activist is sent on a business trip to the forest for four months, but I found it rewarding to walk freely in the forests, live in the village, deepen contact with the Telegin family and improve my Russian-speaking skills. The overall outcome of the event was in line with my expectations, but the path to that outcome was rocky. Terror permeated my soul when I was handed the list of team members. The doctor? Yes, it is very good that we will have a doctor with us. I know him, and he has a great passion for cooking. We could use him. Then there are three Hungarian prisoners of war, cooperators by profession. Not bad either, especially as there is a stable mutual sympathy between Germans and Hungarians. But I can't believe my eyes. Twelve Germans whose surnames I know well. These are the people who have not recovered from scurvy. They can't walk or move their arms. Their joints are completely unbendable, and in addition some of them are known as professional grouches. How to go to the forest for berries and mushrooms with such a list, I have no idea. But the bosses can see everything from above better than I can. It is not worth complaining. It is better to go to the forest and there to decide what to do than to be removed from the position of the senior of this team. It is clear that we will go by truck, where food supplies will be loaded. And how would we get a bag of salt? 
it should be explained that salt in the area of Dezerzinsk was in terrible shortage. At the market in the city, a glass of salt costs up to 20 rubles. During our brief visit to Perekwatkino, we heard that for a glass of salt, there they gave a litre of milk or five eggs. So much for currency. And from our camp, three or four brigades go daily to the bank of the OK River to unload rock salt from barges. Salt is the main raw material of the plant, comes in thousands of tons, and on the shore on the high fenced area lie whole mountains of salt up to 10 metres high, i.e. tens of thousands of tons. A sack with salt thrown over the fence brings a gain of about 50 rubles to transport a sack by boat to the opposite bank of the OK River, 200 rubles, and on the outskirts of the city. 500 rubles for transportation of salt from the bank of the OK to the factory. There is a narrow gauge railway, the steam locomotive of which suffers from consumption. From the bank to the factory, the distance is about 3 kilometers and the rise is about 10 15 meters. On this distance, the locomotive pulls a loaded train of wagons with three stops to accumulate steam. The driver and the stoker take advantage of the fact that they stop just where, quite by accident, of course. A horse-drawn cart has stopped. One or two or three sacks of salt are thrown from the carriage to the cart. The horn blows and the echelon goes. From the outside one can see neither the movement of the sacks, nor the reverse movement of tens of hundreds of rubles. Those who, by the nature of their duties, are supposed to observe such transactions have their eyes glued with bills. You can't leave the bazaar without salt at all. That's how it is. That's the situation. One of the prisoners of war knows someone who knows a narrow-gauge railway driver. A complicated deal is organized in the course of which a three-ton zis of our camp, ready to be sent to the forest, takes the place of one of the carts described above. The only difference is that the crew of the steam locomotive lets one sack go free. The prisoners are thanked for their regular assistance in arranging and disguising the sacks before leaving the barricaded area of the open warehouse on the bank of the OK. Salt was transported by shaft and it was impossible to fill the sacks with salt and load them on the tender of a steam locomotive without the help of prisoners. Getting the salt turned out to be nonsense compared to boarding the men. The sick were lifted onto the Zeiss cargo platform not without difficulty. They were put on mattresses, which we were given for the duration of the mission. After five hours of driving on dirt roads, we came to Perikvat Kino. The car was unloaded in front of the hut allotted to us. People were lying, sitting. Some of them were standing at the gate, which was still locked. The villagers, some old women, old men and children, are gathering and looking at the newcomers with interest. Near me stands an old woman of about 80 years old together with a younger woman. Both of them look at us with big eyes. Suddenly the old woman spoke. No, it's impossible. They are not Germans. They don't have horns. Very carefully I approach her and try to explain that Germans are perfectly normal people. She listens to me still very incredulously then turns away and walks away, shaking her head protestingly. Whether or not she believes we are Germans, she and I have become friends in the course of this summer. The convoyer takes out a key, unlocks the door of the hut, which has only one room, and orders us to sit on the floor until he returns. We are sitting in a hut where no one has lived for five years, and suddenly the hut came to life, immediately, as if on command, crawled out of all the crevices, rushed to the smell of human blood untold hordes of bedbugs. It's like paper flat from long starvation, but moving nevertheless with amazing speed. The attack was so unexpected, swift and powerful that most of these flat creatures, despite our experience in fighting these bloodthirsty insects, managed to win a lightning fast and crushing victory over us. It should be noted that my camp experience allows me to divide people into two categories. In the first, those who are naturally insensitive to bed bug bites and treat forced cohabitation with them quite calmly. In the second, those who fear bed bugs more than death. There were many representatives of the second category in our team, including me. And that's why, in a few minutes after the insidious attack had begun, many of them, disobeying the order of the escort, were sitting not on the floor, but in the attic of the hut. By some miracle, even our paralyzed dystrophics managed to climb up the steep stairs. Subsequently, the team was divided. Some of them stayed in the hut, others in the attic. In the attic, however, there were more mosquitoes. But what is a mosquito against a bedbug? Nikolai Pavich Telegin met us and looked at us. He stands pondering, but instead of crying, he quietly says, No berries yet, no mushrooms. There is time to treat people. 
apparently, he has been warned about the state of the courtium. In the barn of the collective farm, there is hemp waiting to be combed. We need to agree with the chairman to pay for the work with onions. During the day we take there those who can't walk at all, and in the evening the walkers can join, with whom I will walk through the forest during the day to familiarize myself with the area. Nikolai Pavlov introduced me to the chairman, and the success of the negotiations was unexpected. He was ready to give us in advance a sack of onions, the vitamins of which we expected a miracle. The place of work was a large collective farm barn, which was 500 meters from the hut. The distance for a healthy person is not a big deal, but for a healthy man, the only complication in connection with our work to the lake. We were regularly brought transport workers at a distance of 500 meters from our hut to the barn of the collective farm. At first we carried some laborers on our hands. A miracle happened. After a week of intensive onion therapy, some of them began to crawl on all fours to the barn. And after another week, all of them, though some of them could get there on their own, even though their legs were not yet bendable. Scratching hemp is not the hardest labor. And if we take into account the fact that we worked together with the women and girls of the village, it will not be difficult, I think, for the readers to believe that this work did not seem to be work to us. It was more like a merry party. That is why at the end of the day the convoyer had to tame our labor enthusiasm by force. However, the convoyer was not concerned about the convicts not working too hard. He could not help guessing the secret and, for the most part, visibly mutual desires of the cumbers men, which were flaring up by evening. He had no right to indulge in such desires, and it was fundamentally contrary, as it soon turned out, to his own aspirations to rush to meet the secret desires of women. Poor fellow, he had no idea what a burden he was heaping upon himself, the prevailing majority of the women of Perikwatkino as well as of the neighboring villages of Trofimovo, Boyarsk, and Vershilovo, had been made lonely by the war. But the day came when Nikolai Pavlovich said, Blueberries have appeared, and if God gives us rain, we'll soon have mushrooms too. The forest around Perikswatkino is deep, and it's easy to get lost. The thoughtful Telegin started our hikes for berries by teaching us to orient ourselves in the forest by the sun and wind direction. Very soon we were able to go to the forest without the accompaniment of our mentor. We were not accompanied on these hikes by our escort either. Forced because of his nightly adventures to sleep until dinner, he actually did not pay any attention to us at all. He limited himself to one evening check. We couldn't have been happier because thanks to this we could feel almost like free people and wandered through the forest not as a team, but three, two, and even one. I preferred to walk alone. Nature in those places is fabulously beautiful, and it was better and more comfortable to admire it alone. Picking berries and enjoying nature turned out to be quite compatible activities. Berries were scarce. Being the senior of the team and therefore responsible to the camp management for the success of our forest landing, I tried my best to show my comrades an example of labor heroism. However, no matter how hard I tried, still by the end of the day rarely when in my basket was more than two kilograms of berries. The successes of the rest of the team were even more modest. The barrels made by our cooperators, which stood under the awning in the yard of Nikolai Pavlovich, were filled very slowly. But I could not blame my comrades for this. The food was more than meager, and of course everyone sent much more into his mouth than he put into the basket. However, even this very addition to the daily ration could not, alas, in any significant way reduce the acuteness of the problem of nutrition. As you tread, so you will tread, he is a Russian saying, but this medal has another side. And it says, as you fall, so you will fall. We had to stomp a lot. But when we returned from the forest, there was nothing to eat but a ration of bread and very liquid soup, and hunger is not a woman and following high moral principles does not help. Lack of food lowers morality and leads to various actions aimed at obtaining additional food. The salt trade alone cannot feed everyone. The trade is conducted by a doctor who releases salt into the market in small portions to keep prices high. He exchanges the salt for milk, flour and eggs and alternates, each day preparing an individual holiday meal for one of his comrades. Not bad, but not enough. Kunde Nikolai Pavlovich suddenly says to me, Kolya, they complain to me that your people are stealing cucumbers in the vegetable gardeners. It wasn't easy for me to believe it. But Nikolai Pavlovich brought me to one of the women who complained to him, and she showed me the footprints on the bed. The thief was from our team. That's right, if you don't steal, you don't live. Ending this unpleasant for me conversation, said Telegin. 
But if you steal, then steal from the collective farm fields. And if we catch you in our vegetable gardens, we'll kill you. In the anti-fascist school, I was taught that the collective farm system has indisputable advantages over single-person peasant farming. I cannot, with my hand on my heart, say that the teachers convinced me of this 100%, but I did not have the right to doubt, because I was not familiar with the peculiarities of collective farm life, and now I had an opportunity to familiarize myself with them. I had to observe one of these peculiarities every morning. It consisted in the fact that the foreman would run down the street from hut to hut and shut, let's go to work. He would run for a long time shouting until he was hoarse, but few of the collective farmers heeded his calls. Lazy? No. When they stayed at home, they worked hard in their vegetable gardens, as I saw. I, too, was born and raised in a village, and we did not manage our farms according to the instructions of the brigadier chairman or any other public boss. Many families had their own households and managed them according to their own judgment. Not everyone, of course, managed on their own. There were some owners who hired laborers, exploited other people's labor, but even the laziest laborer was not familiar with the feeling of hunger. I got acquainted with another peculiarity of collective farm life quite by accident. I was walking with a basket along the edge of the forest near the collective farm field, and I saw a cart dusting along the road. The cart was a nag, close to starvation. The cart stopped, three men jumped off it. They looked around thievingly. They didn't notice me. They took off the cart, one of the four sacks lying there, and hid it in the dense undergrowth. Then they drove up to the field and started sowing, by hand. I knew about this method of sowing only from historical books. I could not remember that someone had stolen grain from our village. A master won't steal from himself. A laborer won't steal from his master either, at least because he knows that as soon as sprouts appear, the experienced eye of the owner will immediately determine how much grain is sown per unit area and the owner remembers to whom he entrusted the sowing. Besides, it is pointless to steal sown grain. It is treated with toxic chemicals. As I observed such a picture, women are reaping rye with sickles. Nearby stands a combine harvester. I wondered, what's the matter? No fuel, they said. No fuel. Then I saw the grain being threshed, a threshing machine from the last years of the life. I've seen threshers of this design here. But in a museum, in October, when the temperature was consistently below zero, there was still unharvested rye in the fields, blackened, rotten. Potatoes remained in the field. For several days we, together with the collective farmers, chiseled the frozen ground with crowbars. This was a way of harvesting the crop unknown to me before. So what are the advantages of the collective farm system? Hmm, I pondered. It was not that the collective farmers starved, receiving 80 grams of grain for their labor days, while at the same time the unharvested rye was rotting in the field, I confess that my observations of collective farm life did not add to my conviction in the indisputable advantage of collective farming. But let us return to July. The rains finally came in the second half of July. One day I went burying with a basket, and I saw a fly agaric, a pioneer. If it appeared it means that soon it will show the way to edible mushrooms. In a couple of days the cheeseberries appeared. There were so many of them, as they say, that one could mow them with a scythe. Cheeseberries were not included in the plan of our production task, so everything we collected went into the boiler. It turned out to be a thick, tasty porridge. We had enough, only, alas, none of us had enough sense to think. Can our stomachs cope with such a volume of unusual food? During the night, the cheeseberries left our grumbling stomachs with rapid speed. Following the cheeseberries came abundant golden places of chanterelles, which the local population considered to be grebes. At the daily norm of 10 kg per person, we collected them even more. So, all the excessive ones went into our pot people's health, and therefore their mood went up sharply. And there were no problems with mood until the end of our business trip. Soon other, more valuable mushrooms were coming. They were not as abundant as chanterelles and chanterelles and not so close to Perikwatkino but we quickly gained experience in searching for their deposits. We brought whole baskets of blisters, butterballs, red caps, pork nuts and birch bunnies. We also came across white mushrooms and even chestnuts. True, I must confess that white mushrooms and especially the chestnuts did not always get into the barrels under Telegin's shed, but what delicacy dishes our Dr. Cook made from them. There is help on the other line. Regularly in two weeks a car with bread and food arrives. 
It was at the moment of my greatest concern that we found a large barrel of salted sprat among the foodstuffs being delivered. The attendant tells me that the camp has stopped eating sprat, which is a very unusual type of food for Germans. In the canteen there is an open barrel for self-service, but the stock is not running low. Remembering the positive result of trade with salt, the senior camp cook decided to transfer a full 100-meter barrel to Perik Fotkino. The doctor accepted this product into the range of goods he offered and thus further raised the level of nutrition, due to the fact that the trading activity was carried out in the daytime. In the absence of the forest brigade, the organizational forms and price tags of the exchange of goods remained a secret of the doctor trader himself. When potatoes blossomed in the fields, it was decided that there must be tasty tubers in the ground under the plant. It was only a pity that a watchman with a dog walked the potato plots day and night. See reconnaissance established that under the village Vershilovo, about three kilometers from Perikvatkino, the potato plot reaches the very edge of the forest. We decided to see if we could get a portion of potatoes in a night raid. So, two with one comrade we set out at night with a full moon. We were afraid of the road, went straight through the woods, found a target, lay down between the rows and started digging with our hands. The size of tubers was equal to a dough, i.e., to collect for one meal the whole team needed quite a lot of units, and, accordingly, a lot of... A watchman passed by three times at a distance of 100 meters. The dog told him that there were suspicious smells in the field, but the simpleton watchman did not understand the dog language. We deepened in our work so diligently that we did not notice the setting of the moon. It was getting dark. How could we find our way back through the forest? The only way out was to look for a road and follow it to our home. We found the road and we ran into the gark. Why are you walking at night, eh? My brain computer is running at top speed. I think I know how to swear without someone else's accent, i.e. even in Gorky. My answer is a terrible series of maters. Thus, obviously, I convinced the watchman of our complete innocence. He pulled the dog to his feet, gave way to us, and we went away. Perhaps his thoughts had taken a very different course. There are two of them, and I'm alone, and the dog isn't very aggressive. As long as I have my rifle at the ready, they can beat me to a complete pulp. In a word, edge, we were lucky. I remember another more fun adventure. It was time for a car to arrive with bread and groceries, and there was no car for the third day. The escort did not know how to contact the camp by phone, but he realized the responsibility for the team's efficiency. He said to me, Come on, Kolya, let's go to the camp by public transportation. We are already used to the direction. We went, arrived at the camp, found out that the car was being repaired and would arrive in a few days. This information does not comfort us. There is no bread in Perikfatkino. There is no one there to give us bread in advance. So we carry bread over our shoulders, as much as we can carry. The escort must not be burdened with a load. He carries a rifle and must keep it ready just in case. I was loaded with a sack of bread, twenty loaves of one and a half kilograms, all thirty kilograms are nothing. With the sack on my shoulder we go to the station. A train is approaching. There are a lot of people on it, on it, and on the footsteps. The escort deftly slips inside, and kind people make room for me with one foot on the step, and one man allows me to hold on to his belt. In time I manage to move my other foot on the footrest, and at the next station there is a bare place on the handrail. I stand firm, but trouble does not come alone. Thunder rumbles above us, the downpour is heavy. It is getting harder and harder to hold on to my post. It is still at least twenty minutes to Gorky. The bread is getting wet, and the weight of the sack is increasing noticeably by the minute. I am afraid that I am left with only two options to choose from. Either to throw away the bag and save the integrity of my own body, or to fall with the bread. Before I reach the decision, I suddenly feel relief. I raise my head, I see a military man above me. An officer, who took off his shoulder strap and took on half the weight. Two citizens also joined this rescue operation, and as a united team we safely reached Gore. I was not able to thank the rescuers with words, but I remember how they looked into my eyes with a smile. I think I smiled back at them, and the expression on my face must have spoken of the deepest gratitude. Transfer, passage to Balakna without much incident. Transfer to the narrow gauge railway. I'm sitting alone on a bench. The convoyer keeps his rifle ready just in case, but sits on another bench behind my back. A man comes up and sits opposite me. The train moves off, the man looks at me, and from everything I can tell he wants to make conversation. He does. He looks at my hand where I have a homemade silver ring on my finger, and 
German? How did him I answered, and I think to myself, how did he manage to recognize that I am German? You can't tell from my clothes. Me, Sophie, the man asks. Oh, that's what it is. So he takes me for a demobilized Russian frontline soldier, and then suddenly a funny thought pops into my head. I don't know why. I had a funny idea. Yes, I say, ek, it's a trophy. Where did you fight? Second Ukrainian. Now, uh, did you reach Berlin? I did. Must so tell me how the Germans live. That's when it became easier for me to answer his questions. I could tell him about how the Germans live without any lies. Where are you from, friend? He asked me one last time before leaving the station. Litvien, I had to lie again. Ah, well now I see why you don't speak Russian properly. When the man came out, the escort turned to me. You see how gullible they are, Russian men? I venture to describe one more, perhaps the most memorable and dear to me event of that summer in Perikvatkino. Early one morning we left the house to go into the forest. We saw the escort approaching. Why should that be? He's never been like this before. Why did he wake up so early? Or didn't go to bed yet? Nkolia, can you mow? I know how to mow. Good. You won't go to the forest today? The chairman asked for a mower to help him. Wait for him here. I'm going to bed. The escort's gone. I sent the team to get mushrooms. I'm waiting. The chairman comes up, with two middle-aged women and a beautiful girl of about seventeen. We get acquainted. It turns out that the women are the chairman's wife and his wife's sister, and the girl is his daughter. We go to the forest, talking on the way. I feel that they are educated people, and that is why our conversation is not limited to the topic defined by the questions traditionally asked to a prisoner of war, such as, where, when and where was he captured? Do you have a wife and children? Are his parents alive? The conversation is also conducted as equals. I do not feel the slightest coldness on their part towards me as a prisoner nor prejudice. On the contrary, we talk like good old acquaintances. Relaxed, even cordial. How pleasant it is for me. Moreover, the daughter of the chairman, the beautiful Galina, not only takes a lively, genuinely interested part in the conversation, but also, I notice, tries to step closer to me. We go out to a large clearing. We start mowing. Stumps interfere a lot but gradually I get accustomed and try to keep up with the chairman. At lunchtime, a real picnic. Women spread a towel on the grass, lay out on it homemade bread, pancakes, lard, milk appears. My God, when was the last time I tasted milk? But not only that I involuntarily rejoice at the upcoming opportunity to eat such delicacies, but also sits next to Galia, and immediately easily finds a topic for conversation. I feel in seventh heaven. We sit, have lunch, talk. But not even five minutes pass, the escort comes. The chairman and the women invite him to eat what God has sent. He willingly sits down and joins the general convert. He looks at Galina, tries to flirt clumsily with her. But she, oh joy, absolutely does not react to his flirtations. After lunch, the escort leaves. We continue our work. Light-footed, graceful in movements, Galina flutters across the clearing with a rake. I'm waving my scythe out of my skin to give the impression of a dashing and tireless mower, but the hard work does not prevent me from noticing how radiantly shine Galina's eyes when she throws at me her cheerful, and even it seems tender, look a yi. Life, how beautiful you can be even in captivity. In the village, late in the evening after an inspection, the guard suddenly says to me, let's go out for a smoke. We went out of the house, sat by the fence and smoked. Out of the blue, as it seemed to me at first, the guard starts complaining that he is tired of his nightlife. He resented the fact that the women had established a queue among themselves for his visits to them, and strictly watched that, God forbid, he did not spend the night in the same hut twice in a row. And then he suddenly confesses that it was not the chairman who asked him to give him a prisoner to help him in the haymaking, but he himself offered him a prisoner to help him. Purpose? to be able to come to the hayfield under the guise of controlling the prisoner in order to try to win Galina's favor. After all, she is the only one who does not pay attention to him, and this he, Hunter, cannot survive, so he decided not by soap, so gouging her to seize her, and is firmly convinced that sooner or later but will get his way. Oh my God, how painful it was for me to listen to him. I called him a brainless sheep, but what could I say to him out loud? The next day paradise again. All day I work side by side with Gallia, 
true, the escort did not fail to show up, again tried to pave the way to Galina's heart, but she suddenly, to my great joy, unambiguously and even sharply let him know that he disgusted her. So you should, you lustful goat. The days of paradise flew by quickly. The haymaking is over. I'm mushrooming again. My soul is in hell. There are a lot of mushrooms, but I can't see them at all. In front of my eyes I see Galena's face, her smile, her gentle and tender look. God, help me to see her. Galia lives in Vershalovo. It is forbidden for me, a prisoner of war, to go there only with an escort, but I can't ask him to take me to her. God heard my plea. I told the escort that tomorrow, at the request of the chairman, we would go to the collective farm Hayfield, but perhaps Galia will be there too. I pray to God that she will be there, but I realize that even if I have the good fortune to see her again, then in public to talk to her I may not have the chance. I wrote a note. I risked to state in it my request to meet me the next day after sunset at a crossroads a kilometre from Peric Fatkino. In the morning we went to the collective farm meadow. As we approached, many locals had already gathered there. My heart sinks, my gaze frantically slides over those present, and finds Gallia. My soul again flies to the seventh heaven. As if inadvertently we are approaching each other, and I see that Gallia is happy about our meeting is hardly less than me. All day long we work side by side, but under the constant crosshairs of prying eyes, and therefore for fear of being heard not only Galia, and could not tell her that I would be happy if she decided to date me. But I had a note in my pocket. When the moment was right I gave it to her. Galia reads and then nods her head in agreement. The next day I walk through the forest with a basket, and the soul is already there, at the crossroads, and the closer the evening comes, the more excitement grips me. I feel like I will die if the meeting does not take place for some reason. I couldn't help worrying about something else. How can I leave the village in the evening without arousing the suspicions of the villagers? And most importantly, would I be able to deceive the escort as I had planned? The plan was as follows. The convoyer makes a check late in the evening, already in the dark, before setting out on another night adventure. He goes into the hut where the prisoners are mostly asleep at that time. He strikes a match and, while it burns, looks to see if everything is in place. Then he climbs up the ladder to the attic. Or rather he doesn't even go in, but pauses on one of the last rungs of the ladder and just looks up into the attic. He lights another match and looks. Is it all lit? As a rule, we sleep with towels over our faces. That's how we escape mosquitoes. And the escort determines the presence of convicts by these towels and by the bulges of bodies under the blankets. I decided to take advantage of his carelessness. I made a doll, put it under a blanket, covered it with a towel. I made a deal with my comrades. In case the deception was discovered, they would have to tell the convoy of the truth, but not the whole truth. They would saw Klaus, take the basket and go into the woods. But what will the guard do in that case? Will he raise the alarm and go looking for the fugitive with dogs? He has no other choice. But I had no other choice but to take the risk. At dusk I went sneaking out of the village and went deep into the forest, through the forest, through the swamp, came to the edge of the forest closer to the crossroads. I hid. I sit in my hiding place watching the road. Seconds seem like minutes, minutes like hours. But from the side of Vershiovo two female figures appeared on the road in semi-darkness. They came to the crossroads, stop, one of them, Galia? But how can I tell in the dark? Besides, if it is really Galia, why did she come not alone? And who could it be with her? I'm lost in guesswork. I hear women talking among themselves. I listen to the voices, and one of them seems to me the most charming music. Even now I think I would recognize this music from hundreds of human melodies. And even then, I listen again, and it turns out that another voice is familiar to me. It's Galena's aunt. We worked with her at the haymaking in the forest. But why did she come? Why doesn't she leave? I dare to come out of my hiding place and approach. We greet each other, and the aunt says, Galia can't go out of the village alone so late. They might suspect something. But when I'm with her, it's all right. Well, now you don't need me any more. The aunt handed me a bag of food gifts, said goodbye, and left. Galia and I are standing against each other, confused, embarrassed. I can't think of any appropriate words, but we don't need words now. We sit down on a hillside by the road. Our hands, our shoulders just touching each other, the touch burns and we can't help but confess that we feel amazingly good together. Suddenly there's a rumble of thunder. We raise our heads to the sky. A huge black black cloud is floating towards us. Oh God! 
See the cloud, what does it care about our feelings? He's coming at us with merciless speed. It's going to rain. We jump up, look into each other's eyes for a moment, then a sweet shiver of a timid kiss penetrates me from head to toe, and Gallia promptly runs away along the road towards Veshilovo. Immediately a downpour begins. The darkness is pitch black. It's a long way to Peric Fat Kino, bypassing the forest. It is necessary to go, of course, only through the forest, again through the swamp. But how? Seeing the way through the swamp, 300 meters, is laid out in the mire with a line of parallel logs. Even in daylight it's not so easy to go through them, and in total darkness under heavy rain, which made the logs dangerously slippery, I had to get down on all fours and move only when lightning flashed. If you crawled three meters, wait for the next lightning. Thankfully they flashed one after another. So in two hours I was already on my native attic, though wet to the last thread, and though I was so cold that I couldn't get a tooth on a tooth, I was in such a mood that I could sing. If I hadn't been afraid of waking my comrades, I would have actually sung. I could not have guessed on a happy night that our romance with Gallia, which had begun so wonderfully, was destined to fit into the framework of no less wonderful, but only a romance. I never saw Gallia again. Haymaking ended. Another chance to meet with her and agree on a date fate did not give me. There was, of course, I confess, a secret hope that Gallia herself will find an opportunity to meet with me. But E. Debuffs, was it not at all she had no desire to see me again? I don't know how it really was, but my consciousness, perhaps not without provocation from the wounded male ego, suggested to me the following explanation. Our mutual sympathy with Gallia. I am afraid now to define it as love, though that is how my soul felt our relations at that time, was noticed, no doubt, not only by well-wishers, but also, of course, by those who could not regard the sympathy of a Russian girl for a German otherwise than as betrayal. Moreover, there was still in force at that time a law, according to which unauthorized relations of citizens with representatives of the enemy were punishable by imprisonment, and not a small term of imprisonment. Apparently, there was a kind person who explained to the chairman and his wife what would happen to their daughter if she did not calm down. I cannot rule out that our convoyer was such a good man. Like no one else, he had good reasons. But I met with an old woman who did not immediately believe that Germans were hornless. I met her more than once during the summer, and even made friends with her. She turned out to be a nice, kind woman, and when I came to her in the fall before leaving to say goodbye, she even cried and crossed me. Nikolai Pavlovich Telegin could not hold back his tears at parting, as I could not hold them back, when, hugging me goodbye, he suddenly said, Collier, you have become like a relative to me. Some time later, already in the camp, for some reason the convoyer confessed to me that the way to Gailey's heart, no matter how hard he tried, he could not find it, and I thanked God for that. We returned to the camp in early October. The last mushrooms were already frozen. When we set off on foot to the nearest station of the peat bog, my heart shrank at the sight of the fields where black, rotten rye was still on the route. We also walked past fields where it was not difficult to determine that potatoes remained in the frozen ground. How to understand such a contradiction? In the villages it is impossible to say that the population lived in abundance, in the centre of heavy chemistry, which was then the area of Ikumovo station, people rather starve, and here valuable foodstuffs are lost because of slackness in the organisation of agricultural work. That's the advantage of the collective farm system. As I was moving away from the village of Perikvatkino, I was sinking deeper and deeper into reverie. It is a pity to leave this beautiful place, those beautiful people, that beautiful nature. It is sad to return to the industrial centre and live there behind barbed wire, to live there in the cramped, crowded buildings, to no longer be able to walk alone in the forest and admire nature, and to let my thoughts fly anywhere. Even on that day of separation it became clear to me that I will never forget this short period of my life and I will long for people, for nature, and for Galia. I will break the chronological order of my store. I visited the village of Perikvachmotkino on August 3, 1989, when Gorky was open for foreign tourists, but the Gorky region was still closed. Let me, dear reader, at least briefly report on this unnatural adventure. In the early 60s I got a job as a researcher in a research institute, which maintained close business relations with a similar research institute in Moscow. The directorate of my institute was very willing to use my services as a translator, 
because in terms of translation quality, it was better to have a specialized employee than to hire someone else's translator. But I was often in Moscow and became friends with the head of the laboratory. I told Anatoly Mikhailovich about my desire to see the village of Perikvatkino once again a long time ago. But, alas, the Gorky region was closed to foreigners. When the city of Gorky was opened in early 1989, Anatoly and I decided to take a risk. Tolia had a friend, an important employee of one of the union ministries, who maintained close ties with a machine-building enterprise in Gorky. A trip was organized there for a specialist from the GDR to exchange experience. I was the GDR specialist, and Tolia was the ministry's escort. We took a train to Gorky. The director of the plant met us at the station, put us in the car, and took us to the hotel. As a result of the director's negotiations with the hotel receptionist, I concluded that he was confused. The director was told that personal data about any foreign other hotel reception desk was obliged to hand over to the KGB. Therefore, the director decided to accommodate the guests at the factory, where a convenient apartment for such purposes was found on the second floor above the garage of the factory fire department. The next morning a whole production began. The director summoned the management staff of the plant, and each in front of me reported on their achievements. The products of the plant were familiar to me, and I was able to ask wise questions. After a rich lunch, some deputy director turned to us, with an explanation that it is generally accepted to allocate one day of stay of foreign guests for cultural events. Then I tried with all my abilities to explain to the deputy director my desire to go to the village of Perikvoy. He turned to Anatoly in complete bewilderment, with a hint that he had not quite understood what the German had said to him. Tolia confirmed to him that he had understood correctly. And where is this village? Unfortunately, my geographical knowledge was very modest. I explained from memory. We drove to Balakna, got on AIP Tanka, took an hour's drive to the northwest, and then another hour's walk approximately to the north. The deputy director promised to take care. Whatever the outcome, there will be an over-the-road car at eight o'clock tomorrow, then we'll see. So the motor depot of a large industrial enterprise does not have such a geographical map on which all the settlements within the region would be marked, and they don't know whom to ask the corresponding question either. This is Russian hospitality. The deputy director knows that the purpose of the excursion lies in the forbidden zone for foreigners, but he doesn't even mention it. The guest's wish is the law for the host. The next morning, the head of the motor transport department of the plant admitted that no one around and has no idea where to look for D. Perikvatkino. Perikvatkino. I will give an attendant besides the chauffeur. You will drive to Balakna. They'll find out that let's go. The attendant was a very polite man, treated me with exquisite courtesy but it was felt that he considered me not quite a normal member of the human race. In Balikna, the chauffeur and the attendant went around the town. They returned in half an hour with a satisfied expression on their faces. They found a connoisseur. Further on, we drive to the north. In the distance, we see the reinforced concrete dam of the Gorodets Reservoir. We go up to the upper embankment and drive further along the shore of the reservoir. Suddenly, the bell tower of the cathedral rises in front of me. My brains immediately process the picture, and I shout, Stop, it's Vershilovo. In fact, Vershilovo then lay far from the Volga, and now, on the shore of the Gorodet Sea. We stopped at the cathedral, which in 1946 served as a granary. The portal is open, we enter. The walls and ceiling are black with soot. Tourists slept here overnight. A fire was lit, all flammable materials were burned, but the supporting structure of the roof remained intact. Now the cathedral houses the carpentry workshop of the collective farm. A representative of the clergy investigated the condition of the building, but did not give anything concrete to the question of restoration. It will be expensive. So the village of Vershilovo has not changed in any way for 40 years. The same huts, the same dirt streets, the same appearance of the poor. But, strangely enough, I begin to feel at home. We go further along the country road to the village of Trofimovo along the road where we came across the watchman at night with a sack of stolen potatoes on his back. The details of the incident come to life in my memory. How did I dare to talk to the watchman with a swear word? How did he not notice that we were prisoners of war? Or maybe he didn't even want to notice. In the village of Trofimovo, the once a collective farm horse farm, in the stables there were three pairs of half-dead nags. Now there is an MTs on that place but the change is small. Instead of nags inoperable due to hunger, 
There are now a dozen tractors of all kinds of ages and sizes, which by the look of them serve only for spare parts. There are two tractors in the workshop, on which a group of men are doing some repair work. We say hello to them and ask if they know the Teligan family. It turns out that they do. In Perikvatkino lives the youngest son of Nikolai Pavlovich, Pavel Nikolaevich. His house is the only newly built and stone house in Perikvatkino. I think he should be home. Let's go. The country road from Trofimovo to Perikvatkino first climbs a low hill, where once stood a barn where flax was combed. In place of the barn is now a newly built sheep. And suddenly an incident unfolds before my eyes, which is extremely difficult to describe in words. For all these years after leaving Perikvatkino, I have kept in my memory that lovely picture, which opens to a visitor when approaching the village from a hill halfway from Trofimovo. I had to close my eyes and direct my thoughts in a given direction, and at any time I saw an imaginary landscape of a Russian village drowning in greenery, with a dark strip of forest in the background, and what is done with me now? I close my eyes, open them, and what a miracle! The natural picture does not differ from the one fixed in my memory. This is my Perikvatkino, the same village as it was forty years ago. Nothing seems to have changed during this period. But there is some optically insignificant defect, the nature of which was explained later. We stopped at the house of P. Intelligen. We found him at home. We got acquainted. He was stunned with surprise. He asks what drives a man from distant Germany here, in the Russian countryside, to see the village of Pirikvatkino. T. Intelligen is about forty years old. He dimly remembers a German who spoke Russian and with whom Papa often went to the woods. Here, he says, let's test your memory. Show me your father's heart. Pavel Nikolaevich and I in front, the chauffeur, the attendant, and Anatoly behind. And, not having gone one hundred steps, I pointed with my finger at the elegant hut, painted in blue with white decorations, and I was not mistaken, despite the fact that the Telegin's hut used to be painted dark. On the opposite side of the village street, the hut in which we lived during our stay in Perikvatkino catches my eye. What a meeting! My thoughts return to that period of my youth, when as a prisoner here I enjoyed the happiness of maximum freedom. How I loved this village! I treasure the memory of this beautiful and lovely place. Leaving the village, we head towards the creek where the swamp used to be. I look at the village from the outskirts, and it becomes clear to me what is the fundamental change in the picture of the village. There are no vegetable gardens behind the huts. There is pure steam. Sertin Kalayevich Telegin told me that in the first post-war years, the population lived mainly on the products provided by personal farming and the forest. Everyone had a cow, goats, geese, chickens. Everyone had a plot of land for potatoes, cabbage, cucumbers, and so on. But they were reluctant to work for the collective farm. According to Telegin, Crush Clay put an end to this situation. Cattle were taken away. Gardening was forbidden. Today people live worse than in the first post-war years. So much for the advantages of the collective farm system. After walking along the bank of the stream, I asked the men accompanying me to leave me alone for half an hour at least. I was in such a state of mental excitement that I could see no other way out but solitude. I did not expect that a new encounter with this area could have such an exciting effect on me. I walk along the meadow, where before there was a swamp, where one night under thunder and lightning and heavy downpour I crossed on all fours from the wooded eastern slope to Perikvachkino. I try to regain my peace, instead of excitement to rejoice that at last I was destined to see my favourite village again. I see a couple of women with baskets coming out of the forest not far from me. They approached me. It became obvious that the older one was not younger than seventy, and the younger one was fifteen, twenty years younger. As the older one walks in laptops, we say hello. I start a conversation. The younger one tells me that they came from the town of Pravdinsk for mushrooms. They've been going around the forest since morning and the harvest is bad. You can see the bottom of the baskets. I know that from the city of Pravdinsk to here is not less than twenty kilometers in a straight line, and this distance back they have to walk. It's a sin to think of public transportation here, but I guess I could probably be the miracle worker in this case. Talking, we approach the car where they are waiting for me. I ask the chauffeur to put the old woman and her daughter in the car, as it is on our way to Pravdinsk. He agrees, I say goodbye to Pavel Nikolaevich and we set off. Unfortunately, I don't remember the topics of conversation with new passengers, because all my attention was focused on the environment. We arrived in Pravdinsk, 
stopped for the women to get out of the car. Both of them express their deep gratitude with words, and the older one pulls out a small handkerchief with a knot from under her skirt, opens the knot and offers me a rubble for the fair. It is impossible for me to hold back my tears. I hug her. I explain that the payment is only for the driver, but he refuses. I wish her well. We set off and I feel that I've left a piece of my heart here again.